Okay, well, uh, this is our final session. Uh, this is really a session where we would, l you know, the idea is to use the opportunity to have a bit of a brainstorming type session on how should we engage with and think about India-China studies from uh, multiple perspectives, especially you know the uh, global you know angle to it. Mm. And since we invited uh, many of our colleagues, colleagues who have or whose scholarship and whose work uh, has been uh, really uh, uh, focused on India-China story for a long time. Uh, I, we felt that it would be, you know, a missed opportunity or not an optimal way to really just only have them serve as discussants and chair a couple of sessions here and there. But why not to really uh, use the opportunity to uh, again, you know, uh, think together uh, about both, you know, uh, get a deeper understanding of what's happening with uh, or when you think about India-China studies uh, globally. Uh, and what kind of collaborations, what kind of questions uh, uh, we uh, ought to be uh, raising, we ought to be wrestling with in order to uh, both support each other and uh, benefit from it uh, in the long run. Uh, so I think it's with this particular you know, uh, set of you know, uh, thoughts that uh, we felt it would be good to spend at least an hour or so uh, on uh, thinking about re-envisioning India-China studies uh, today. So we'll spend about an hour. Mm. We had a similar session in China and in India, but in China and India, after young scholars shared their work, we focused mostly on China studies when we were in uh, India and India studies when we were in China. And now is a good opportunity where we could bring the US to that conversation. We could look at India-China in a much broader way. So, so that's the purpose of uh, this particular session. Uh, the three colleagues that you uh, see uh, here at the podium uh, uh, really, uh, of course, you know, they are at the forefront of this conversation. But uh, uh, you know, I think uh, I have asked them, you know, mostly to really share uh, some of their thoughts uh, to uh, both, uh, you know, uh, highlight some of the things that they are thinking about, but also as a way to engage all of you uh, in this conversation. So, so at some point, I think you know, we want uh, to invite you uh, into this conversation. Um, so that it can be far more richer. We know that uh, there is no set uh, positions on how one could go about thinking about re uh, India-China studies. Uh, from my perspective, I think uh, one of the things that I have learned uh, over the past nine years of dealing with uh, young scholars, established scholars, dealing with institutions both in university settings and also the so-called think tanks, including there are think tanks that are emerging uh, in both the places. Some of them are uh, you know, uh, e even funded by uh, private uh, sector groups uh, like Observer Research Foundation. Uh, and of course, in China, there are a number of institutions, uh, think tanks, uh, who are uh, directly you know, supported by government uh, you know, agencies, either from the central government or even provincial governments. So, so we really have a wide range of actors who are uh, you know, involved in the uh, uh, India-China studies in, in, in a broad sense of the word. Um, we see a number of you know, issues that one uh, ought to uh, look at. One is really this idea that I mentioned, you know, how do you think about India-China studies beyond the area studies uh, framing? Especially when you are thinking about interdisciplinary uh, dimension to uh, India-China uh, studies. So that's one set of questions. Uh, of course, you know, uh, then there are questions related to uh, pedagogy. Uh, and I think we know uh, because of uh, 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 number of issues, the way uh, you know, uh, scholarship uh, is pursued, uh, 
uh, the way the training takes place in each of these countries. And there is, again, a wide range of you know, uh, uh, experiences uh, depending on where you study. You know, if you are based in Delhi, you get you know certain set of you know resources, access uh, that shapes the way you know a new set of you know scholars are emerging. If you are somewhere in uh, second or third tier cities, then you know you face uh, you face different set of issues, and same is true for China. So, so the pedagogy, uh, you know, is something that is very, very uh, important uh, in our, you know, uh, interactions. And I know that Tansen has done a fair deal of work on this, and I'm sure he will talk a bit about that too. Uh, there are language questions. Uh, Chinese uh, or Mandarin, as you all know, is not an easy language to learn, and uh, it creates all kinds of uh, challenges, especially for uh, scholars in China who are interested in India's story. Tansin just told me that uh, he did a bit of research for us that uh, I think last year or recently there were about 150 PhD dissertations that focus on India, you know, but most of them are in, uh, in, a, uh, in a, uh, uh, Mandarin. Uh, all of them. All of them, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so I think you know, it, it raises all kinds of questions. Why you know, we receive only you know, 15, 20 uh, uh, responses to our call for papers, whereas in India, you get you know much larger response, 80, 90 you know uh, applications, but then the quality issues become very very uh, serious. Uh, you, know, you know you can pick 10 or 15 of them you know who are at a you know, uh, you know uh, uh, or at, at a level where you can really engage with them. Then the rest of them pretty much you know uh, need a significant amount of work. So the la language question I think plays uh, in both India and China, but in slightly different ways. So I think that's another set of questions that we need to think about. Uh, and as I mentioned in this morning, uh, when you think about young scholars, uh, what is interesting is that young scholars are coming from different places. They are not just only based in your usual uh, departments or uh, centers that is dedicated to either China studies or India studies uh, in these two countries. And s similar things are happening in the U.S. too. You know, we, we have uh, now, although the numbers are still you know, quite small, that we do have now uh, young scholars who are based in various departments uh, around the U.S. who are looking at India-China story uh, 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 from different uh, uh, disciplinary uh, perspectives. So I think you know we need to do a better job of reaching out to them and engaging them with the uh, institute's work. Mm. I think broadly speaking, it would be fair to say while uh, governments, uh, universities. Uh, in India, China, they have to do their work in terms of how best to advance scholarship on India, China. Uh, I think uh, there are some movements. Some of them are uh, painfully slow. Uh, in some cases, you have uh, you know uh, universities that have uh, actually uh, faculty lines available, but for all kinds of reasons, they don't get necessarily you know uh, uh, taken up. Uh, so. Irrespective of that, what is interesting also in the era of increased globalization, if I may use that term a bit lightly, uh, is uh, that there are interesting possibilities that are emerging that uh, allows you to think about collaboration uh, uh, among various actors uh, that uh, you know uh, could be very interesting, both you know from intellectual point of view and also from just basically capacity building, you know, dimension of uh, things. And you will hear a bit about uh, uh, one example, at least from Alka's group, you know, that you know has formed a very interesting partnership with uh, Harvard's uh, you know Yanchen, uh, Institute, and uh, where I think Nirmala is one of the candidates. So, so, so I think there are interesting models that are beginning to emerge where uh, we could think about collaborating uh, in ways that was simply not uh, uh, happening or not possible just a few years uh, ago. So, so I'm really excited by that. Uh, so, so the basic goal really is uh, to request our colleagues to share some of their thoughts uh, about India-China st studies from a global perspective. Uh, and then you know, really invite you all to share your thoughts uh, and hopefully we will continue to work with each one of you to find ways to uh, you know, support each other, and hopefully in the process, uh, look at ways to uh, advance uh, scholarship, uh, focus on India-China, 
uh, you know, uh, in the coming years. So on that note, what I would do is I would request first uh, Professor Liu Jian to share his thoughts, maybe you know, uh, maximum 10 minutes, because that we want to have enough time. Uh, and then uh, Professor Alka Acharya, and then Professor Tansen Sen. Thank you. Uh, at most uh, 10 minutes. That uh, in Chinese uh, Indian studies, traditionally has been classified uh, into two uh, categories. The first was the uh, traditional uh, Indology, which mainly focused uh, upon uh, Sanskrit literature, uh, Buddhism, and uh, of course, with the uh, tr translation of uh, Indian Buddhist literature into Chinese. Also that uh, scientific works, and uh, such as uh, astronomy and the math, uh, mathematics uh, works, have also been translated into Chinese. And therefore that uh, in Chinese and also in Tibetan language, in the Dai language in the South uh, Yunnan province, I have uh, learned that they have kept off a lot of uh, uh, works translated from uh, India. And uh, even today that uh, Indology in China is still developing very fast. Uh, more and more young people have become Sanskrit scholars. Uh, in recent years, I have uh, examined uh, uh, doctoral dissertations written by students uh, uh, by, uh, from Peking University or uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. I have found a lot of uh, very excellent young scholars uh, emerging, uh, including Zhang Yuan, who attended the conference uh, in Yunnan. Uh, that uh, also the, in my academy, uh, that uh, Sanskrit center uh, was established a few years ago. And the main achievements in the past years, uh, including the translation of Ramayana, Mahaprabhu, and uh, Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita, and also uh, Upanishads, uh, 15 Upanishads. And uh, more and more people have become interested in uh, uh, traditional uh, in knowledge. But the modern Chinese Indian studies in China emerged in about in the uh, late 19th century. It began to develop in from the early 20th century. When Rabindranath Tagore visited China, uh, Chinese uh, interest in India uh, uh, was uh, on the increase. And the uh, Chinese people wanted to learn more and more and uh, all aspects of India, Indian development, not only confined to Buddhism anymore. And uh, scient uh, really scientific studies of uh, India, systematic study of India uh, began in the uh, 1950s uh, after the founding of the People's Republic of China. And uh, that was mainly uh, conducted by the government in the 50s. And uh, in addition to translating modern Indian literature or literary works into China, uh, Chinese government began to uh, pay attention to the development of uh, society, politics, and the uh, economy in India. And uh, this Indian studies yeah, developed uh, uh, was uh, after the 1962 war, uh, Indian studies in China came into a standstill for almost 20 years. After the, uh, since the end of the Cultural Revolution in China in the late 1970s, uh, Indian studies in China began to flourish. And uh, I would say that every year, uh, hundreds of papers uh, uh, are written and published. And uh, in the last two decades, uh, Indian studies in China developed uh, drastically. I think that uh, with, with, uh, well, China and uh, India both are economically uh, rising rapidly, more and more people uh, and the whole nation uh, that uh, focus upon the development uh, of India. I think uh, vice versa also Indian scholars also pay attention to the development in China. And uh, some research, uh, uh, research, uh, research uh, work uh, has become more and more objective and more and more scientific. Take, for example, that the China-India border dispute. 
which has lasted for more than 50 years. And uh, before I came here, I examined about uh, 30 application material uh, for the National Social Science uh, Foundation scholarship. That uh, one of them uh, uh, was about uh, uh, how to solve China-India dispute of borders uh, in terms of law, uh, international law. Uh, and uh, so that uh, uh, people's uh, research uh, are developing in depth. And uh, we find that the students uh, began to write uh, um, uh, as a graduate uh, uh, thesis or doctorate dissertations. A lot of them focus upon the subject of India, various aspects. Now that uh, China has about, uh, according to my uh, uh, that uh, recent uh, knowledge, that uh, about uh, 200 or more than that uh, are engaged in Indian studies. Uh, and not long ago that uh, China and India uh, scholars have uh, uh, been working together. We have had meetings uh, several times that uh, we are f nearly finishing a project that is the Encyclopedia of uh, uh, China-India Culture, uh, Thai Contacts, uh, time space that uh, passed more than 2,000 years. And it is not uh, confined to uh, culture only. It, in fact, covers uh, uh, diplomatic re relations, uh, all these affairs that uh, um, uh, that was uh, that is uh, written by both the Chinese and the Indian scholars. Interestingly, that uh, in writing this uh, uh, encyclopedia, we find that uh, Chinese uh, scholars who know Sanskrit or Hindi, Bengali, other Indian languages, uh, more than Indian scholars who know Chinese, uh, that. Uh, we translated the Indian entries into Chinese. But we find that the Indian scholars asked, uh, trusted the embassy in Beijing to look for some translation agency to put the Chinese writings into English for them. Then they revised it. Uh, therefore, the people say that now that Chinese people have really interest uh, in every aspect of India. I think this has increased the Chinese understanding of the history and a better judgment of what has happened in the past. And uh, we always think that uh, India is a mirror for China. In history, we have learned too many things from India. Even nowadays, that we still need to know and learn India well. And uh, scientific studies, uh, research that uh, can uh, offer uh, uh, is that uh, uh, reference, a uh, mirror uh, for Chinese in her uh, modernization. I think that uh, both um, Indian studies in China and uh, uh, Indian stu Chinese studies in India and the Chinese uh, study, Indian studies in China are developing and also uh, comparison of China and India has become a very uh, long and heated subject for international uh, scholarship. Uh, therefore, that um, no uh, Indian uh, scholars uh, research, uh, Chinese scholars uh, studies, and the international scholars concern, all this I think uh, can give us uh, some enlightenment uh, teachings uh, for the two countries to solve their problems and uh, to develop uh, uh, to develop uh, uh, more peacefully and harmoniously, and uh, to create a better Asia and a better world, and a better China-India relations. I'm full of confidence for this. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, well, since we've got 10 minutes, I propose to really um, focus on my experience uh, over the last uh, 15 years. Um, around the time when I had completed my uh, doctoral uh, thesis and started to teach. I was, uh, I've been located in the Jawaharlal Nehru University. In India, we have a School of International Studies where we um, 
Area Studies is a center for East Asian Studies, which has China, Japan, and Korea. And I was located in that department uh, since uh, 1995. Now, uh, we also have in this university a School of Language, Literature, Culture Studies, which teaches the Chinese language. And uh, that is, in a nutshell, the problem which characterizes area studies in India and which really is um, the reason or why we are in the kind of slightly problematic state that we are in, which is that the language and area studies have been taught in two different schools. And the same set of students uh, are not doing both things. In other words, the language people are going in their own way, and the area studies people are going in their way, and uh, the twain don't meet. Uh, what we have is a year's training at the uh, MPhil level after post-graduation, when they enter the research program in Chinese studies in the School of International Studies, and one year in which they do um, two semesters of some uh, not very rigorous kind of a introduction to the language, after which they get busy with their uh, research and uh, then get into the PhD program. There are some committed ones who do continue with the language against all odds because outside the university framework, we still do not have any institution which teaches the language uh, systematically. And uh, therefore, we have, over the last two decades, uh, built a group of young scholars and scholars in the field generally, whose hold on the language is extremely tenuous. Now, in many ways, it's not really the fault of these poor young people who, who do not have the language, because we really have not provided them with the institutional um, options to do the language. The agreement between the two countries uh, that uh, allows for the exchange of about two dozen scholars um, a year, it does not really uh, meet with the requirements which are growing over the last two decades. And uh, finally, I think the, 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 the linkages between India and China, other than the government, are extremely tenuous. Now that, in a nutshell, really is being the, the continuing state of the, the field, as it were. Uh, in which I have now started to look at various options. I shifted to the Institute of Chinese Studies two years ago. And um, this institute is about 30 years old. Uh, but formally, as an independent institute, it is uh, now only four years old. Now, the unique part about this institute always was that it had people from the university set up uh, associated with this institute in an informal capacity, honorary capacity. And it became the platform for a wide-ranging discussions on China, because all these faculty which were associated with the institute came from different backgrounds. So in a sense, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary kind of an approach to discussions on China uh, was, was part of the way in which this institute grew. And secondly, it became a platform which actually started to network with other scholars from the rest of India. And because it was the only institute of its kind for for large number of years, uh, it also became the place where scholars from China came to first. Now, that history of the institute has given it certain advantages, which we have over the last two years tried to push. And this is where I come to, uh, to what really is the way forward. And, that comes out of my concerns about what I told you, plagues area studies in India, and the trends that I see unfolding before me. Uh, I wouldn't say two decades ago, but certainly around the turn of the century, we see a, a shift in the way in which the state has now started to respond to what it feels are requirements uh, about China. Uh, suddenly, there was a realization that we didn't have enough experts uh, who could talk knowledgeably about China's internal scenario. Uh, by default, the f thrust of our scholarship in India has been in the international relations uh, and more foreign policy realm. Scholars found it easier to work on foreign policy because the bulk of your resources are in English. Um, and 
it, it, it became easier to talk to people uh, in China who were working on foreign policy because they were the ones who could, who, who knew English. So suddenly this need to start to engage with China, which happens at the turn of the century with um, an improvement in the bilateral relationship, um, wakes us up, wakes up the, 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 the main agencies in India, particularly the University Grants Commission and the MHRD, about the need to expand. So two things have happened. The University Grants Commission has now put in a huge amount of resources for China studies, which has translated in two ways. One, they have opened up area studies um, centers across the country. Uh, some of them are located in um, IIMs, that is to say, in Institute of Management. Some of them are lo located in the IITs, which have social science departments. Some of them are located in universities. But the idea is that it should have a kind of a pan-Indian spread. The second has been that there has been more money for research purposes, which has been funneled and channelized through the Indian Council of Social Science Research. Now, these two things have actually suddenly brought uh, uh, brought into prominence the fact that outside of the traditional foreign policy, international relations research, a lot of research is actually going on in, in India about China. And the Institute of Chinese Studies initiated some eight years ago an All India Conference of China Scholars. Now we are in the uh, in eighth year now. And this is essentially a conference which we do in collaboration with a research institute or a university outside Delhi, anywhere in the country. And uh, the idea is that this becomes the platform for, for bringing together students, scholars, even senior people who are working on China um, to, to, to talk about it. Now, the last year, in fact, we received a record number of, of uh, responses. And the interesting thing was that as I mentioned, a lot of work that is being done is being done in small universities and towns across the country. And these are not uh, sort of area, traditional area studies kind of uh, uh, topics. These are topics which are slightly technical in nature. A lot of people are working on, on the water problem in India and uh, on, in China and therefore comparative kind of. Uh, people are working on um, agricultural issues. Uh, they start with looking at their own scenario and then immediately move towards comparing it with India. So, uh, with China. So, there is a lot of now, um, a lot of, lot of work being done on comparative issues. The second thing which struck us very, very, uh, uh, very, very glaringly, as it were, was that a lot of this work really requires support through, uh, by means of putting them in touch with the right kind of people. There is a lot of interest. There are a lot of ideas which are, which are out there, but they need to be structured and they need to be supported by field work. So as a, uh, as, as, uh, as a kind of, a, let's say, nationally networked institute, we have now uh, we, we, we are now focused on gathering information about this work that is happening throughout the country. As I said, that it spans a wide range of issues. It's no longer just the traditional domains. It's going into micro studies and it's going into economic, social, political, cultural. So we have this, this, this raw material as it were. Now how do we actually channelize this? One way of doing it is of course using whatever means we have within the country to ensure that these people do get uh, opportunities to come to the places where there are repositories of material and information, uh, support them in their primary collection, primary is in the first stage collection, and then see how to move them on from there. Uh, the second has been to tie up with other institutions in China and increasingly, we are having a lot of um, a lot of institutes in China that we have we have been signing agreements and MOUs with, and try and see which are the scholars that we can put them in touch with, or whom they can correspond with, and who can actually give them inputs. So this networking within and with China is something that we have started uh, very systematically over the last couple of years. Um, we still do not have sufficient funds to be able to take these 
young researchers and send them off to China. Uh, but we are hoping we'll get there. Third initiative that is happening, and this is where I see the new school really coming in uh, in a big way, is uh, this initiative that you spoke about, which we got into, this collaboration with Harvard Yenching. It visualizes a research fellowship which takes students from <coughs> India who the, 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 the only qualification that, that is a must is that they should know the language. Um, and their research proposal has been approved in a university. We send them for a year to China. And then after doing one year, strengthening more of the language, getting their uh, data and so on, they move to Harvard for a year. And that is really, these two years are going to uh, give them with the best of the the, 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 the Western scholarship and, of course, the Chinese, and then they come back to submit their research. Now, if this kind of a, a pattern can possibly take off in a slightly more, uh, at the moment we've uh, signed an agreement for only five years and uh, only two students a year, because the first two years of their PhDs, we have to support them. And then the other two years is being uh, taken care of by, by Harvard ENG. So this is another initiative. Now, the last point that I'd like to make here is about the fact that if we are looking at these partnerships, because there is no um, doubt about it, we in India have entered a period of expansion and diversification of Chinese studies. It's still fairly disorganized. It is still not uh, um, structured in programs in different universities. For instance, people working on China may not belong to um, any, any area studies programs. They could well be in, in this. And in fact, there are not many uh, area studies programs throughout the country. So they are located in specific disciplines. And that is where it seems to me that given the fact that we still do not have those those, those, those structures and institutions which can, which can uh, strengthen language capabilities, we need to now move the other way, which is that we take good social science students and put them into the language. And for that, the collaborations with China, um, we've been putting pressure on the government to increase the number of scholarships from 25 to at least 200 a year, uh, so that at least we can, we can send these uh, scholars who are, who are essentially historians or political scientists or sociologists or studying anthropology. Um, they may not have China, but they need to be sent because they are interested in working on it. So this move now, and that is in one way that would address the problems of how do you go beyond the area studies format. So now no longer it is that pick up Chinese studies people and, and try to uh, give them that, but rather pick up disciplinary students and, and put the Chinese language into them and then uh, push the frontiers of, of their research. Um, and finally, the point that um, Professor Liu Chien was speaking that you know there is really a lot of interest now in India, China, it's quite clear. And somewhere the research is also being fueled by the fact that what you've, what you've seen in the last decade are, are a profusion of writings uh, by, by journalists, by, by completely um, informal kind of uh, writing, which is not very accurate and uh, in many ways not, uh, a, a very, not doing a very good job. But of course, it's, 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 um, it's increased the profile of the fact that India, China is now the hot kind of topic uh, all over the world. But the, the specific focus on India, China, I mean, I, I do see a huge rise in the number of people who want to look at what is really the problem between India and China. So whether it is to look at the border problem, uh, whether it is to look at the perception problem, the, the legal dimensions, uh, there is a substantial increase in people who are wanting to look at this. And again, we need to open up the, 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 the frontiers uh, in this area by providing them with the opportunity to go beyond what is already available. Otherwise, it's just going to be more of the same. And uh, various uh, things have happened at the official level between the two countries, which are showing us the possibilities. It's just that we will have to keep pushing uh, for, because at this point, we still do not have uh, the, the, the situation that, let's say, 
the corporate sector or the big business houses are stepping in uh, to fund research on China. We, s we still have not reached that stage. So the state is still going to play a major role in helping us push and increase and broaden, diversify uh, the ways in which research can be pursued. But I think we need to realize that interest in India and China in India is now a big thing. And how do we support this is the big question for the next uh, few years at any rate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll make uh, two quick announcements. Uh, one, uh, I suggest to uh, people who have come from abroad, China and India, to visit MET, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, today they have started a wonderful exhibition on uh, Hindu Buddhist art in Southeast Asia. Uh, they have some of the rarest pieces that you will ever see. Uh, so you should take this opportunity uh, to take a look at uh, the exhibition. I think uh, Ashok was planning to organize, or, or, uh, or maybe Grace didn't tell you. Um, but I think uh, you should, <laughs> you should, you should try to try to visit uh, if possible. Uh, the second one is. Uh, 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 in, in my biography there, in, in, the, in the, uh, the file you got, it says I, I uh, am editor, series editor of uh, India-China Studies from Anthem Press. Uh, actually, I'm in the process of moving it to Oxford University Press, uh, and I'm going to talk to them uh, earlier next month. So if you have any manuscripts uh, on India-China, uh, and I'll talk to you about what I mean by India-China, uh, please let me know. Uh, about it, uh, they just want some brief description of what's coming uh, and what can possibly be considered as part of uh, publication. This is Oxford University Press in Delhi, uh, but they have good connections with uh, New York here uh, for broader uh, distribution of the book. Uh, the last volume from Anthem uh, in the China series would be on comparative study of Indian and Chinese immigrant communities. We don't call it diasporas. Um, but uh, I think it will be a good uh, work on comparing these two uh, uh, people in different settings. Uh, this is following up on something that Hong Kong University had done. I think, Alka, you may have participated in, in that. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with something uh, that uh, Alka uh, had said, uh, perhaps her fourth or fifth point. Um, I'm, I'm not interested in the quantity of work. I'm, I'm interested in the quality of the work. And, and that makes me very pessimistic. Uh, uh, I've, been, I've been for the past two years writing something on the state of the field uh, in India-China studies. Uh, and I've been reading a lot of material from India-China from various parts. And as Alka was pointing out, uh, the quality of some of these uh, are really horrible. Uh, um, and they get published in India because you can pay a publisher to publish your writing. Uh, uh, almost same thing in China. Um, so, so I think the quality of, of things that are coming out from India and, and China, uh, you should use them carefully. Um, and and uh, although Professor Liu pointed out uh, that there have been a lot of writings on India, China, still I find Chinese scholars not using uh, Western secondary material. Uh, none of their footnotes seem to have basically seen some of the fundamental works on, on India-China relations or, or things. So there seems to be a problem there. Uh, same thing with, with the Indian scholarship uh, uh, on, on, on China. Hardly anybody uh, uses uh, Chinese source material. It's all Western translation, English translations published in either China Daily or South China Morning Post uh, or, or New York Times. Uh, so there is, as Alka was pointing out, a language issue on both sides. It uh, doesn't matter. But uh, I think for me, India-China studies is separate from Indians doing research on China and the Chinese doing research on India. A translation of Ramayana does not necessarily mean it fits into India-China studies. Um, or, or if an Indian is translating uh, Lucian, it's not necessarily part of uh, India-China studies, unless there's some sort of comparison uh, with uh, uh, any Indian writer, Tagore, for example, or perhaps uh, some other story with, with Ramayana uh, that you are doing. So for, for me, uh, India-China studies uh, should have either a comparative aspect where uh, sources and data from both uh, countries, both regions are, are, are used, uh, or uh, are studies of the relations, uh, interactions between the, the two states now or, or in the historical period. So it's, it's, a, 
it's more narrower than perhaps uh, what we would like to do. I, I, I think we should separate uh, Indian studies in China and Chinese studies in India uh, as, as a separate two categories. Uh, now here, uh, from I'll be using what happened this morning with, with the presentations here. There were, uh, I think, uh, eight, seven or eight papers, seven papers, uh, and uh, well, most of them were about contemporary uh, economic uh, uh, issues, uh, comparative in nature, and and all those of you presented, I think, realized from from the comments that nobody was satisfied. Everybody said, "Oh, you know, India wasn't explored properly, or China wasn't explored properly." That's that's the main issue, uh, and this is something I've been telling uh, the other junior people who are part of another initiative that Ashok had started, the uh, India-China U.S. Uh, exchange of students is what is the unit of analysis um, that, that you are doing? So Gujarat and Chengdu, uh, uh, why Gujarat and why uh, Chengdu? Uh, Chengdu is a city and, uh, or, uh, and, and Gujarat is a state. Uh, and uh, so uh, why not uh, perhaps Madhya Pradesh and Ningxia or something, uh, places for, for which people have not actually done uh, research on. So I think it, it has to be very carefully uh, sought out uh, what is your anal unit of analysis. India and China are not uh, really a good uh, analytical points. I was just uh, looking at Pallavi Ayers. I think many of you know who Pallavi Ayer is. Um, uh, she used to write for the Hindu, uh, and she has written an excellent book on China and recently on, on Belgium uh, as well. Now she's based in Indonesia, and she said in a comment, we should compare India and Indonesia. Why are people interested in India and China? Uh, I think that makes sense. I mean, why do we limit ourselves to India and China? And this is something Sanjay was pointing out. There's a mandate to do US. Uh, same with Nirmala's thing. And there, you have to look at Japan. Uh, I think uh, doing India and China for the last 25 years, uh, I've realized that you can't have India and China without considering the neighborhood, uh, or perhaps broader than the neighborhood, uh, from the historical times to the present times. And even when you say India, what India do you actually mean uh, in, in some of the presentations today as well? Uh, English among the Indians, right? Uh, which Indian? Bengalis use English differently, perhaps, from a Jat uh, living in Haryana. Uh, but, so I, I, I think using India as a category or China, I mean, why leave out Xinjiang or, or Yunnan or Tibet? Uh, they are part of China. I mean, are you speaking about Han Chinese uh, and perhaps Bengali Indian? I think that perhaps is something that you can narrow, narrow things down. So I, I would be very cautious of using India and China as a general categories unless you want to work specifically either on a region, sub-region, uh, or specific uh, group, ethnic group, uh, or location. I mean, that's, that's something you really have to be uh, uh, careful about. So for me, the unit of analysis is, is very important, especially when you are doing comparative studies. And most of the papers today uh, were uh, about comparative studies. For me, uh, the first question I would ask, why did you pick these two units to analyze? What is it that stands out? Is it worth comparing? Is it apples and oranges or apples and apples, Indian apple and the Chinese apple, uh, if there's such a thing? Um, but uh, I, I think that's, that's something we have to be very careful about, and that's something that's very missing. Uh, the list that I compiled for Ashok, uh, this was uh, Chinese uh, writing on South Asia in general. Um, so there's a database in China where you can basically search MA theses and PhD dissertation. It's, it's not a very hard work, but you can, you can actually look at these dissertations and theses. And, and from 2003 to 2013, that's what I looked, 10 years. Uh, there were five uh, dissertations uh, in 2003 on South Asia, including one on Nepal. Um, 20 on in 2012. Uh, most of them either working on specific aspect of India, uh, not comparisons, uh, very few on comparisons, mostly working on, on Indian art and in Indian literature, uh, Indian history, or relations between India and China. The issue of comparison, I think, is something that India-China Institute should take on and, and look at the methodology of doing it. And this is something what I've been telling uh, Ashok is we have to set 
what are the methodological ways in which we study India, China comparatively, or in a broader sense. Without doing that, I think many of the writings uh, are, are problematic. Uh, and, and you'll have same kind of comments as you got today, uh, is that you didn't look at the land acquisition from this point of view or, or the economic statistics from that point of view. So th that's, that's very clear. And then this relates to what kind of information you actually get uh, in China and in India. Uh, and, and this is something that came out uh, during our meeting in Kunming. The Chinese students were complaining that we don't know exactly where to go in India to work on India. Uh, uh, and, and where can we go and get our visas taken. So there are some practical issues about bringing data to the Chinese working on, on India from a comparative perspective. Same thing with the Indians. Uh, where do you get, uh, for the Indians it's more difficult because they don't, don't understand uh, Chinese uh, uh, and they have to depend mostly on English material uh, and unless you are Bamsi, you can't do things properly uh, with, with English material. Uh, but uh, even, even, even Amrita Sen, when he writes about comparison between, let's say, Kerala and, and China, uh, or Prasad uh, Bhardhan, who is writing, uh, will use uh, sources that are available in English. And, and his, their selection of the provinces will depend on where the English material is available. So I, I think uh, India-China Institute should perhaps try to do these two things. One is set a methodology uh, and try to make the data available uh, to people who are interested in perhaps some kind of a website where this kind of data uh, should be available. And, and here, I think uh, the, the role of methodology for uh, people who are trained in the U.S. Uh, matters. I think students who have uh, graduated from U.S. universities could mentor uh, people like Nirmala, uh, and I think that's why the Harvard program is so essential, uh, uh, and, and the Chinese scholars as well, how to cite sources, uh, how to make footnotes, uh, how to analyze things, uh, uh, question the sources. Paula is here somewhere. Um, but I, I think those are some of the methodological issues that, that you really need uh, to, to highlight. Um, the final thing uh, I, I would like to, to say, and this is a, this is a very sad part, uh, China Bhavan, which used to be the premier institution uh, in India, uh, 50s uh, place where you would go to do India-China studies, that, that was really a center for India-China studies. Uh, there were people, Indians, who knew classical Chinese, knew uh, various kinds of Chinese sources, and Chinese who knew Indic. Uh, material would come together and work on India, and they had a general called Sino-Indian Studies. Um, and that place still exists now. Uh, there are 100 students there. Their library is the finest library on China about uh, primary sources. Uh, unfortunately, none of the students can read the material there. Um, they have collaboration. I mean, uh, Alka was pointing out there are some local collaboration. They have collaboration with Inan. Uh, but the Yunnan people also can't read traditional Chinese characters. So when they, are, when they are doing the library, they have put all this Republican period material in a shelf which, which is gathering dust because they don't know the importance of that material. So collaboration with, with Chinese in, institutes does not really mean they will be able to help you out uh, in, in, in the ways that you need help with. So I think there again, uh, Harvard and, and uh, ICI uh, could play an important role uh, in, in connecting India and China uh, and, and, and raising some of these issues. Uh, and then here, I think the teachers uh, that are teaching now in, in India, and there's a lot of ent enthusiasm in India as well as in China, they need something that we do here in, in the US, faculty development programs. These teachers who are connecting with these emerging scholars need to be retrained. Uh, I think they need some kind of training as well. And, and here at the Institute of Chinese Studies in Delhi uh, and some organization uh, like PETA. Uh, because if you are doing something in Shenzhen, 
you can't do a PhD in Shenzhen because your advisor can't guide you. He is not qualified to have PhD students. The only place you can do is, is Beijing. So it moves to Beijing. Same thing with India. You have to go to Delhi. Uh, very few people in Calcutta can actually guide you in doing research on, on China. So I, I think this, this matter is just beyond India, China. Uh, and, and we should not depend on the state. State has, uh, has its own uh, opinion. And uh, even though you are doing the encyclopedia, I don't know how you are writing the 1962 war. Uh, but I think uh, there should be a private initiative to train students, and they should be uh, encouraged to have their own opinions, uh, not directed by the state. And here, I think uh, what uh, ICI is doing is, is really very, very important. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Liu Jian, Professor Alka Acharya, and Tan Sen Sen. Uh, for uh, raising a number of questions, and of course, you know, a uh, lot of things that one could possibly consider. And of course, you know, the reality is that there are things that uh, one is positioned to do them somewhat well, and there are things that one should not touch, you know. Uh, but I think uh, the uh, purpose of this particular conversation is uh, to. Uh, both understand what's happening when you think about India-China stu studies, both from country perspective and globally, but also you know what are some of the areas uh, are, uh, where we can collaborate. So I think uh, uh, this was really really helpful. So let, let's kind of invite you know colleagues, uh, you know anyone from the audience to really uh, make you know uh, your comments or you know uh, questions to the uh, panelists here. And, and we just want to take another 30, 40 minutes to really uh, have a much more of a round table type uh, conversation. So please. Chris, yes. You have to speak. To the microphone. Yeah. I think the mic's turned on, so that should be OK. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your insights. So my question. Uh, comes primarily as a, an advanced PhD student who's year, year and a half out from being done with his dissertation, doesn't speak any languages in China or in India, but is increasingly being involved more in work in the Himalaya region and in both of these countries. What advice would you suggest for young scholars who are basically at that defining moment where they're haven't completely set their career track, but they're heading there quickly and are interested in doing more research on India and China, particularly comparative studies, but have challenges not only of language, but of deciding in terms of the fields we're in, so I'm a political scientist by training or political theorist, where can we actually contribute important research moving ahead on these questions? I think you need a good advisor. I think I think that's uh, the main thing. Uh, if if you are not uh, very clear about the sources, uh, and uh, for you most likely, uh, you may have to go there and, and talk to the people. Um, I, I think uh, you an advisor will help you out about existing sources. Uh, I think that's that. This is another thing I found missing in many of the presentations this morning: uh, an analysis of existing scholarship. Uh, of, of how, uh, I think this was brought up by Paula, is how, what is the new thing you are contributing to, to the scholarship? So be, before you go, find out what exists. What are the, uh, the, uh, the perhaps arguments that have already been made? And how do you go about uh, making a new argument? And what kind of sources uh, do you uh, need to do that? Uh, if you think it's difficult to do, don't do it. I, I don't think you should should do it something that's totally impossible. Uh, and this is where your advisor may be helpful uh, in, in channeling you. And, and, and this is important for both uh, Chinese and Indian students as well. Uh, a good advisor will perhaps give you uh, ways to work around the deficiencies that you have with regard to language. Uh, I don't think language should be a barrier. Uh, but I think uh, it would be good uh, to find uh, ways to work around it. Uh, you can always hire local people uh, to interpret or translate for you uh, and, and perhaps use the data uh, that you collect. And, and there, 
the analysis of data becomes more important than the use of language, all right? So I, I think that's, uh, that there are ways to work around that and contribute to the field. I don't think you should be discouraged, but I think you, you have to really know where you stand and what you can do. Uh, don't broaden the topic too much. Uh, focus very narrowly of what can be done. Uh, and I think whatever you do would be a contribution to the field. Uh, I think, uh, and, and I, I hope uh, that, uh, that I think there are people here, uh, I think you're fortunate to have people here like Lily who can help you uh, walk through this kind of maze uh, of doing research in an area like that. Dujian or Alka, do you want to say anything? If you want to make study of uh, China, uh, you want to study modern China, China then that I think um, still need to know some Chinese language, uh, which can help you to find uh, a lot of uh, uh, useful resources, uh, materials. For that, uh, in China is different from India, is that uh, most uh, Indian scholars, writers, uh, write in English. Therefore, that you have a lot of uh, uh, English works, uh, material and information from India. But most of the Chinese scholars uh, write in Chinese. You don't, and uh, only a very small number of them have been translated into English. So what uh, is available um, in English concerning China is very, very limited. And uh, sometimes that we make studies of uh, uh, modern India or modern contemporary China, still we may resort to uh, classic uh, works, uh, classic uh, writings. Then we even need to know uh, classical Chinese well. Danson said that uh, even now that uh, peace scholars in Yunnan uh, still defend them, they cannot uh, read the uh, classic Chinese. It is a problem that uh, about uh, half a century ago, that I would say that, uh, that the old learning or the old education that um, uh, uh, laid the focus um, upon uh, traditional studies. Uh, so one scholar must uh, no uh, traditional uh, Chinese language, uh, classical Chinese, uh, well. And uh, in modern society, I think uh, people who know classic Chinese, like people who know Sanskrit in India, is very numbered. Uh, sometimes uh, you can find that uh, even Chinese, when they put uh, classic Chinese into modern Chinese, you can find that oh, they have made the wrong translation. Uh, but uh, his idea is a good one, is uh, that if you, uh, it is impossible, you can still ask someone to interpret and uh, to translate. You know some material in China, you need it. Then you can find some people like the translation agent. They can help you to, uh, you need to spend money, of course. Yeah, that they can help you to translate Chinese material into English for your reference. I'll just add the same, I mean, a little bit slightly uh, differently also that, yeah, I, I think the first thing is you s if you're at the stage where you're just about to begin and, you know, there is all this great desire and not too sure, I, I agree that you have to start with a good supervisor who can help you negotiate that terrain which, you know, takes you from the realm of uncertainty to certainty. But the language is something that I would say that has to be the, the, the basis. I mean, for a long time now, I've um, been grappling with this problem and it's, if you cannot talk and interlocute uh, your, your area, it's, it's, it's not a very, Having said that, of course, there are areas which you can do without the language as well. I mean, where you, for instance, uh, economics these days, there are a whole lot of economists who are teaming up with counterparts in China, and you get the data, you get the translations, and um, after that, what you're doing is with figures. So, um, and then there is also now a large number of Indians who are looking at Chinese writing in English. So I have a young scholar in JNU um, who's, uh, who's working for his MPhil. He worked on Wang Hui and his writings. 
so English writings, and he wants to take that up into PhD and, and research on contemporary Chinese political thought through Wang Wei. <coughs> and just look at Wang Hui's writings in English. Now, there are, of course, people who can, who can have problems with that. But the fact is that you know, there, is, there is this dimension as well. So, so it's, it's a hugely opening up kind of a field. I think one just needs a, a good person to have uh, who will nego help you negotiate this. Thank you. Mark? Hi. Um, this also relates to language training. Um, so I was struck by Alka's remark uh, that the language department was housed uh, outside of or separate from the School of International Studies. And I thought that that was such a, an accurate description of a lot of, uh, let's say, state universities in the US you know, where you might have um, you know, all languages from all over the world housed in one department where Asian languages or just Chinese might be a small uh, fraction, a minority of the faculty, but then you have lots and lots of students majoring in international studies or in, in history or whatnot who are interested in working on, say, China or India, and, and the, that language department uh, who is, you know, housed by tenured faculty doing research on language and literature have, you know, rightly uh, not so much interest in producing, uh, you know, as one of my colleagues at a place before I came here said, uh, you know, we're not the Berlitz Academy of Languages, so don't expect me to crank out 50 Chinese speakers, my department to crank out 50 uh, Hindi speakers or 50 Chinese speakers in a given year. So. I think this is a really serious structural problem in higher education, probably also exists in, in, in China. And w what do we do then? Um, you know, if, if we talk about all these uh, changes coming to higher education where budgets are all important and production of student and credit hours is all important, um, how can we uh, design uh, a, a way in which uh, people are, who are interested in, in doing social sciences or history or what have you um, can get the language training in such a way uh, that they're not uh, you know, dependent upon a, a you know, PhD granting languages department for their training. I, I, the only suggestion I had to maybe get this started is um, something uh, that I participated in back when I was learning Chinese called the Inter-University Program or the Stanford Center, which was a consortium of universities that uh, pooled their resources and trained 20 or 30 people. In those days, it was in, in Taipei, in Taiwan, uh, for a, a full academic year, both undergraduate and graduate. And of course, that costs money too. But at least uh, you know there's this there's this resource base to send students to you know in situ in the in the the, the place in which the language they're learning is being spoken, um, sort of in the case of Taiwan, <laughs> uh, for those of us who studied there, studied Mandarin there. But um, how feasible uh, this is to all three of you? How feasible would it be to uh, for for universities uh, in India, universities in China, universities in the U.S. to uh, have this sort of consortium design? where uh, students from multiple consortium participating universities could go and learn uh, together. It's also, it was also a great chance to meet uh, you know, people who were going to become historians and social scientists many years down the road, and I'm still good friends with, with lots of them. So is, is that too high of a price tag, too high of a, of a burden to, to hope for? Because I think the way of just doing it where you're dependent upon the language department in your university in most cases is really quite uh, difficult. I mean, wonderful. I think it's uh, something that really needs to be, uh, be, be sat down and fleshed out. Uh, I think there will be, um, there will be some uh, quarters in India who will be very sympathetic and responsive because we've been working at this for the last two, three years. We've been uh, talking to all those uh, agencies and institutions um, which are now showing an interest in opening up their, their mindsets and opening up the possibilities. Uh, so I think if we can have some kind of a proposal which we can flesh out um, and, and put it, uh, I mean, I, I would throw my weight behind it, totally. I think uh, uh, there's a more to that problem. Uh, it's not just taking courses, it's uh, what courses you are taking in, in languages. I mean, as you know, I mean, here 
when we do China studies, we, we have a two-year requirement for Japanese. Uh, and beyond that, there's a course called uh, Japanese for Sinologists, uh, especially for those of us who have to read uh, Japanese language secondary material, secondary sources. Um, for people like Nirmala, I've been, I've been arguing with Delhi University where she is based. Uh, she does, cannot benefit from just spoken language Chinese courses, which undergraduates are taking. She needs courses where reading is emphasized. She needs to read uh, Chinese newspapers and an original material. So unless uh, these language departments, and I think DU is doing better than JNU uh, by combining uh, studies and, and languages, uh, they really have to start catering to this huge demand to study China uh, and open up new courses for people who are advanced are not undergraduate students. Uh, so MA, MPhil, PhD students could take courses like what we had in Beijing, Pao Khan, right, reading newspapers, uh, those kinds of courses that could be offered to them where they pick up the characters to recognize the characters quickly than just being focusing on how to pronounce Chinese words correctly, which is not really needed by them. Uh, so I, th I think those, uh, Beyond just the uh, structural problems of Indian universities, I think the departments that now offer Chinese languages have to rethink. Same with, with, the, with the Chinese. I think uh, uh, Hindi is, is OK, but is limited to some places. Uh, but Bengali is not taught widely. Uh, Tamil is, is limited to one place where people are learning how to be uh, in the radio rather than to use the language uh, to do research. So I think uh, in, in, the ch in the case of China also, the regional languages uh, have to be promoted. And, and uh, the, the, the distinction between studies and languages also exists uh, in, in China. Now that uh, China uh, can absorb more and more foreign international students to study language uh, in some uh, very excellent universities in China, like Tsinghua, uh, Beida, and uh, Beijing Foreign Studies University. And uh, while studying in China, not only they can learn the Chinese. In fact, according to my experience, that. Uh, uh, a foreigner can learn Chinese, uh, modern Chinese, uh, uh, well in one to two years. But if you really want to know the classic Chinese, basically uh, that uh, uh, classic Chinese, it need you to take to five or six years. But I really fi find that uh, I was in New Delhi with uh, um, Shabari Mitlo, and we were uh, revising uh, one entry about uh, Tagore. And uh, he could read the Chinese I wrote uh, smoothly, without any problem. Mm -hmm. so that was really amazing. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> of course, that uh, she uh, frequented China, stayed in China. I think uh, if you give students such chances in China or India, uh, I think anyone who is interested can become a really excellent scholar. Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to discuss about like, the quantity and quality about the like, campus uh, completion. Actually, uh, for people like us who are doing, uh, doing uh, completion, it truly is very hard work. Why? Because, like, firstly, we are studying other countries instead of our own countries. So we're competing with the uh, counterpart in, in other countries. Sometimes, we are more difficult than, like, I teach Indian politics in China. But I'm saying I, I can, can be much better than Indian people in, 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 in India. So this is the important, this is the difficult thing. Uh, like the, and, and another thing we I need also to compare with China, and there are Chinese people who are only focused on Chinese politics. So in this style, they, they will say you are unprofessional. And in this style, they will say that, you, I know they are pale uh, per, per persons. So why we come to completion? So this is a problem we, we should be some kind of, I, I, I would like to say, the, uh, at least two factors we need to can consider. One is the compli uh, very complicated situation of the completion. Uh, like the uh, similar things, same things, different things. How to define these two uh, different things? It's, um, and it's impossible to find, like we said, we, it's impossible to find same leaf in one tree. Same thing happened also. We, it's impossible to find uh, same country 
or same set of countries, we can compare them. So we, if we discuss, discuss about the question of comparable or uncomparable, this is, I think this is there is ne never, never be any answer to it. So sometimes we will be more tolerant to people like us who are doing comparison, uh, comparative awards. Uh, this is the first uh, factor. Then the question is like Lu and Ji, like my, my settings. And in, 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 in times you come to some other countries, you, you will, because you are from China, so people may, may, may they will criticize you that because this is Chinese, like, like, like me, Chinese my setting, Chinese ideology, and, and maybe people will put similar criticism against Indian people. Just you are from India, so you think think things and on their way. So non Jews or like these mass settings will come out as some kind of the source of the criticism against the scholars, especially young scholars who are pursuing on the comparative and uh, comparison uh, research. So I just what I'm saying is why so why if if, if so, people why why don't you come to comparison? Comparative studies. I think the, the, the problem is that they, for comparative studies, they can provide new view uh, for your old studies. So that's why I think it happened to me uh, after I went to India. So I find new things toward my uh, understanding on China. So I, I think the, the first thing is that they can find something interesting. But these, these things, sometimes we cannot say that this is an argument this is very definitely, uh, this is some kind of the uh, rule or some, something very scientific or very strong argument that can met. I, I, I think I would like to say this is some kind of hypothesis people try, try to provide. Mm -hmm. And maybe some errors in, in terms of the knowledge, in terms of the backgrounds, in terms of understandings. But we can discuss. But we can, like, like that, we can improve. We can yeah. discuss with him and help him to improve his research. So this is the meaning of the cumulative of studies I, I'm thinking about. Another thing is like that to understand each other sometimes is difficult. Like, like, like that just now, Tan Sin Sen mentioned about uh, Gujarat and Chengdu. The thing is that because in the language acquisition in India, this because the state government played the uh, deceive lot in the language acquisition. But in, in the case of China, most of the case is focused on the uh, miracle Government. So sometimes I, I know that there are different levels. In, in China, we, we, the counterpart should be uh, Sichuan province. But in, in, in terms of negotiation, we should take Chengdu as the uh, other case. So, so I, I think that this is some kind of more understanding and more discussion is really important for the comparative thank and you. studies. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I just have a, a few comments on the, the language and the research, comparative research on China and India. I think there, um, I don't, I'm sure you all are aware of that, you know, that China is, you know, the uh, part, of, part of the government initiatives have this kind of like a Confucius Institutes, you know, everywhere, and, uh, particularly in the United States. So I think this is, the whole idea is actually where, um, language learning and also this culture, you know, exchange. So I was just wondering how those kind of model would be able to, you know, borrow it or replicate it in terms of like a training, you know, the um, uh, the Indian s students or scholars to learn Chinese language, or and uh, the other way around uh, for the, you know, the. Uh, Chinese students and scholars who actually to understand the Indian culture and uh, society and uh, also the language. So, and also this is something I think is might be, you know, uh, for the Indian China Institute to think about is whether we can actually really using this sort of like uh, collaboration, you know, uh, based on the, you know, the um, university wise collaboration um, for some American universities or in the Chinese and uh, Indian universities to really form this kind of network to do this kind of exchange. Yeah, that's my. Thank you. Well, uh, 
thank you very much for the uh, excellent uh, institutional uh, ideas. Uh, I have a, a couple um, points more from my own experience. Uh, the first thing is I think in China, the interest in comparing with India has indeed grown significantly. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, let, uh, this re disregarding the quality for the moment, um, because in two, 2005, when I was uh, conducting my field research in, in Beijing, people laughed at me. You know, why do you even compare uh, with India? And uh, most of the Indian specialists uh, or works uh, focus on Buddhism, indeed on Buddhism. And uh, uh, in the recent uh, couple of years, when I visited China and I, I actually was invited to, to give policy talks to really senior uh, officials and uh, advisors to government policies and uh, on what China can learn from India. Uh, so I'm very, I was very pleased with this trend, and uh, I do believe uh, that just uh, by putting these two countries together, they could uh, learn uh, uh, immensely from each other's experiences. So I never make the value judgment who is better than others. Rather, each of the experiences uh, were rooted in their quite a unique historical uh, uh, context. Um, the, the second point, I think it's uh, uh, in the United States. States, we um, we have at BU we have done a lot uh, uh, in, in training the undergraduates uh, in the Asian studies. For instance, uh, um, I think the interdisciplinary because you guys all mentioned how to uh, make the language training and combined with humanity and the social science. That actually has uh, um, uh, we we have done uh, the the at BU and uh, for a while in East Asian studies in the language training plus humanity courses plus the social science courses. And uh, in this year, I actually expanded uh, to uh, Asian uh, studies. So my efforts was to make the China India uh, the language as well as training more, uh, um, uh, uh, have broader audience in particular. And the third point I really want to echo uh, uh, Dr. Wang's sentiments, um, that it's actually very, uh, it's, a, it's very challenging to do comparative work, and I can now see that because I feel like better my book is finally out. But I worked, I spent 10 years on this project, and uh, 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 if it's not for the comparative pair, the countries, the, uh, the process of publishing might be easier. So I, I do think we, um, as a as researchers, and we took this endeavor and ambition to pursue the compar comparing uh, two largest countries and uh, trying to go into their domestic politics rather than the, the, the external side uh, is, is a bit hard. Uh, so as a remedy, so I, I will support anybody who do do this, uh, but I think uh, uh, as this institute, you know, um, you know, just to have a list of these uh, specialists on this, and uh, for uh, interesting uh, students or scholars, you know, send them to. To, to people who had the experience and hopefully can give them some lessons and you know, not like a, a lesson about the, like the wrong lessons what the what kind of detours you should uh, avoid if you are pursuing this and uh, some of the hurdles you might uh, encounter and what are the possible ways to deal with uh, the challenges thank you thank you but in the last I'm the last yes. last but not least. Um, I, I have uh, some some comments and, and a concrete suggestion, perhaps uh, for India for the India China Institute. But uh, first, um, a few comments. One thing that I would really want to see um, coming out of research that pertains to India and China is not just a comparison between India and China or some historical studies or even religion studies, but other let's call, call them transnational issues. So for example, uh, I would love to see work on gender. And I think that's a huge issue for both uh, India and China in many different ways. So um, that, that would be one area of interest. Another area of interest, of course, me coming from politics is political activism. I don't know to what extent that would be allowed in certain environments, but that would be, I think, extremely relevant and um, 
interesting um, beyond the current comparisons uh, or the current thoughts on, on India and China. So um, my suggestion and, and sort of good news for Tansen Sen is um, the good news is that quality of writing in the United States also takes a while to develop. So um, we go through a very rigorous training and it still lacks on a lot of occasions. Uh, so um, the concrete suggestion perhaps that I have is, uh, for example, the politics department at the new school has a exchange program with um, Dresden, um, the technical university in Dresden, where uh, advanced PhD students are sent to Dresden to teach courses. And because of the type of training that we have, we can definitely engage uh, with not just um, issue studies, let's say gender or politics or political theory, but we can also teach research methodologies. Um, so if that is something that is of interest to um, universities in China and India, we can definitely pursue that. Um, so not just to get uh, students from India and China here um, on a very minimal exchange, but also to send um, budding academics into those environments to, to develop something. Thank you, Marina. Well, I think as I just said, this is really a brainstorming session. Uh, uh, oh, you want to? I, I just, short, please, I just yeah. wanted to say one short thing. Yeah. I want to compliment the Institute on uh, your openness and your staff's willingness to appear at things like today. And the programs, for example, uh, like Friday night, when a gentleman here was willing to share personally about his experience walking to sacred places, and also uh, things like The Desert Eats Us, that film, and then your discussions of inequality uh, in both India and China. Uh, the openness of your faculty is astonishing to me, and I want you to know that I appreciate your willingness to uh, reach out to the community, all of you. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, okay, well, on, that's a very positive note, so I shouldn't take too long. Uh, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, share with you that uh, really, uh, when you think about some of the comments that uh, emerged uh, out of this very brief exchange, um, it's obviously, you know, as Marina kind of hinted towards, uh, making of a good scholar really is a, you know, work, you know, that, you know, you know spans over a long period of time and, it's a combination of various factors, you know, uh, that has to come into, uh, or they have to converge. Uh, so, so I think the, many of the questions or you know ideas that were discussed, some of them are really simply. It doesn't matter whether you're in the U.S. or whether you're in India or China. It's just really simply in you know, a matter of how you go about getting your so-called quality education. You know, and I think you know. Uh, so I think there are things that you know uh, we cannot really uh, control. Right. Then there are questions that emerge that are really more related to structural issues, you know, as to how different universities in different parts of the world, including in the U.S., as Mark was pointing uh, towards, you know, when he mentioned about community colleges, I think they, they do produce, you know, certain, uh, you know, uh, possibilities as well as limit, you know, certain way of, you know, scholar, uh, uh, scholarship, you know, that uh, uh, takes place. Uh, Third, of course, is you know there are language issues. There are you know uh, government's role, private sector's role. So I think those are all, all the things that you know uh, I think anyone interested in that part of the world, we we are uh, following that. And there are some encouraging signs that both you know uh, Professor Liu Jian and uh, Alka you know indicated to. I hope you know they do you know uh, uh, help develop uh, a pool of uh, good uh, you know, scholars. I think at the institute, uh, uh, especially here at India China Institute, we, we are also engaged in, uh, uh, in a set of questions. You know, for example, I mentioned this morning uh, about this new intellectual uh, agenda or you know frame that we are wrestling with. It's called economies and societies. And when I hear my colleagues uh, talk about that, uh, it does you know help me uh, you know perhaps you know think about. We know that when you think about India-China studies, there are in, in certain fields, whether you know international relations or you know security studies, we do have a number of people who are working on that. 
for all kinds of reasons. But what if we as, you know, uh, a group of, you know, uh, scholars who are uh, interested in India-China story, can we come up with, a, you know, I guess, you know, set of, uh, you know, ideas or areas where we as, you know, a group of people could suggest, you know, upcoming uh, students or, you know, students who uh, are looking for topics or areas that they want to study. You know, for example, in, under economy societies, our, many of our colleagues believe that there's something interesting happening uh, in uh, the way the role of capitalism uh, in, uh, uh, is in play in uh, places like India and China. Uh, uh, the way, you know, uh, I think uh, the uh, entire, uh, or, or you know, I shouldn't say entire, the way, you know, society, state relationships are being renegotiated or, you know, are being debated. Uh, so are there areas that require, or at least in the, from the social science perspective, where we could, you know, come together and think of, you know, uh, uh, both questions or possibilities where young scholars could be uh, directed at, I think could be helpful. So this is one request that I have as we, uh, you know, end uh, today's uh, very uh, rich uh, conversation, that if you have some ideas that you think we ought to entertain, uh, and if you have time, please send us a note. Uh, I think in a, uh, our goal is uh, to uh, you know, stay open, as a gentleman said, uh, you know, uh, of how best to really uh, engage with those who are interested in that part of the world. Uh, and I think uh, today's conversation was primarily about really uh, looking at India-China studies and how best we can you know, both understand what's happening and how best we can respond to wherever we can. We cannot respond to everything that you know, uh, has been suggested. That's very clear. But I think there might be areas where by collaborating together or by bringing our respective strengths, we might be able to at least make some contributions. So I think that's the intent here. So I just want to thank all of you, especially three panelists, for sharing their thoughts. And this is a conversation that will continue. Uh, so now I think what we would like to do is invite you to you know, just hang around, have a you know, bit of you know, whatever is available there. Uh, there's still some food, I see. Uh, and, uh, and then you know, at, uh, I think around 7.30, we need to uh, vacate this space. So thank you very much. Thank you all.